Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. Tonight, we are going to talk. We are going to talk about how to do really good case studies if you want to be a surefoot practitioner. So, um, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the process of becoming a surefoot practitioner, and part of that process is doing six case studies for each hoof level that you're go that you're going for. So, if you're a one hoof and you want to go to a two hoof, you still have to do more case studies. Um, there's different requirements for those levels, um, but we're going to let Joe Watman, our master at case study review, uh, take us through the process and tell you all about it. So, hi, Joe. It's great to see you. Thanks for doing this tonight. Oh, that's my pleasure, Wendy. Thanks for inviting me. And um, yeah, I hopefully this should answer a lot of questions and just help everyone feel a little bit more relaxed about um, taking a video of themselves and, and sending it on to someone else, because that is... I know um, can be a real challenge um, videoing yourself, not just working out how to do it, but actually then watching yourself back and going, oh my God, I'm really, really bad. <laughs> when in actual fact, you're not, you're fantastic. So um, yeah, just wanna fill you guys with some confidence and um, just do it. We're here to support you. Um, we, we, we want you to make it through to the end. So um, we certainly are gonna do everything in our power to help you get there. Sorry. Um, yeah. we, we do have a question from Linda. I just want to read this because um, she said would, she'd like to be a surefoot practitioner applied, but not sure that we're accepting people with a degree in occupational therapy and interested in expanding into more equine based activities. So we're really looking at how to handle this. And the, and the biggest issue that we run into, of course, is always liability. Um, that's, that's the hang up, at least in the United States and other countries, there are different laws and different requirements, but certainly here in the United States, because we're, we're not teaching you all the skills of working around horses. We're focusing primarily on teaching you how to use surefoot pads and do the surefoot program. So we, uh, you know, we're kind of in this little bit of funny gray area for people that want to become practitioners that, that aren't necessarily sure equine professionals. And the hang up is the insurance. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking at that and trying to figure out, is, is there another path? Is there a third path between yes and no? Um, and what that looks like. And so we're still in the stages of discussing that, trying to sort it out, um, brainstorming. We, we're um, trying to consolidate the whole process right now. We've just had a great meeting with my team that's working on some backside stuff to make it more seamless for anybody going through that process. And we're still working on that document that we used for the webinar last time so that it's really clear and concise and you know what the steps are. So that's really the, the issue that we run into in the United States is the liability insurance. Um, and um, we're, like I said, we're working on that to see if we can't come up with a good solution for those people that are kind of in that gray area between um, you know, no, not just a horse owner and not quite an equine professional. So stay tuned. Um, hopefully we'll get some clarity on that soon. I get to go back and have conversations with a bunch of different people to see what we can come up with. And so great question. I wish I had a clearer answer for you, but just know that we're working on that. Um, but tonight, I guess yeah, I'm, I might just add to that. Um, in the meantime, you know, um, just use short foot with your own horse and watch Wendy's um, the uh, introductory guides or the guides on using using the, the paths and get a real understanding for what they are and what they can do and just yeah practice 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 with your own horse yeah or you know find a friend's horse that you can mess with yeah. too that that's okay with that the, truly the more horses that you uh, play with and and use the pads with um, in a, you know, just kind of an educational way, the more you're going to learn. And it's, it's the kind of thing that uh, it kind of grows on you. I think Joe will, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it, you kind of take it at one level when you start, and then you start to realize there's a lot of nuances and subtle levels. Um, and so the more horses you can mess with that, it just deepens your understanding. And I just want to say that there was one person who, um, uh, took a workshop. And at the time, it, I wasn't sure that she was quite on the path, but then I saw her later and it was amazing. She had messed with a lot of horses and used the pads and it, and it crystallized and became really clear to her. And so she was a professional already. And so we, you know, she's moved on. Um, but 
it, it is it is a um, sort of a, a I don't want to say a maturation process as much as sort of a deepening process that you go through with the pads. So um, she just responded, I'm doing that and have understanding of perception and sensory systems and neurology. So you've got that background. So we just you know it's just sorting out that one little piece that um, and and the liability piece is to protect you as more than anything because. Um, I carry a liability policy. Joe carries a liability. I'm pretty sure Joe does in Australia. Um, it's to protect you, you know, and that's really what it's about is um, it's just unfortunate in, in this country, there's the, the need for that much. And Linda, you'll see as we go along right at the end, um, I have a quite a good example of um, Why? a horse that the applicant thought was okay. Um, but as I watched, I knew it wasn't okay. And we see what happens when we don't recognize when they're not okay. <laughs> um, so you, you, you know, that's fantastic. You've got the proprio reception and sensory, you know, background. Excellent. But one hoof is really about um, the offer and we're not really getting into, I guess, using the pads as a rehabilitation tool or prehabilitation tool so much, so much in one hoof. We're really looking at it from a safety perspective and implementing the program how Wendy des originally designed it. Um, you know, and so the, we'll go through thought, that. as an OT, I mean, I know uh, um, it's, it's a big, it might be a big lift for you, but there is the SERP and CERT training. Um, the one at UT Tennessee, um, Catherine Wyckoff, one of our four hoofs, who's a Feldenkrais practitioner and she's got a PhD in physical therapy, she went and did that. And so, you know, that's a credential um, and certainly would be a great place for you in terms of taking the skills that you have and then turning them into the skills for horses. So that might be something for you to consider. I, I don't know what's happening with the program currently, but Catherine's gone through it. Um, there's an online portion, then an in-person portion. Um, and Dr. Adair is totally into surefoot pads. So there's that synergy there too. Um, so but reach out to me at the end too, Linda. You can flick me an email. Yep. That's yep. a very Australian term. Flick me an email. She'll <laughs> be right, mate. <laughs> uh, uh, yep. Uh, uh, it's the type into the chat. So it's the CERP and there's a CERT. And one is at the... I think it's Animal uh, Lab Institute, which is in Florida. And then the other one is UT Tennessee, Knoxville. It's Dr. Stephen. And, you know, if you want to talk to Catherine um, Wyckoff, the four hoof. Uh, and she has been through that training with Dr. Adair. Um, okay, so there it is in the chat. Um, and yeah, because we'd love, we, you know, we love to have qualified people and having the OT background and understanding the sensory system and proprioception. It's fantastic, right? I mean, those you folks that have that background that you just understand it at a whole nother level. Um, uh, it's just sorting out that insurance piece and having some degree or qualification. Okay, so on to case studies. Joe, do you want me to do those? Yeah, you, share, you can share. Yep, perfect. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Let me just move it up into the world and play from start. Okay. Okay, so uh, Shuffle Equine Stability Practitioner Case Study. So we're doing this webinar because um, you know, sometimes there's confusion around what you need to do or how to do it. Um, we do have a case study packet that's quite detailed in, in what we require you do. Um, and we have a one hoof, um, uh, um, what are they, a demonstration of what we were covering. What's demonstration that? of proficiency. Profic prof prof proficiency document that details quite a bit um, you know, what we're looking for and what you need to do. So, you know, leading up, there's quite a bit of reading, but these things are covered off in the case studies. And of course, I cannot emphasize enough just the quick start guides that Wendy has done on the YouTube channel. Just look at those because pretty much 
that's showing you showing you everything you need to do in for one hoof. Um, so we'll just flick to the next slide. Oh, oh, oh. Hang on, sorry. Oh, <laughs> I have okay. to find my little arrow. Got it. Oh, yep. Okay. Okay, so we'll just quickly run through the levels that we have. And this was covered off a little bit more in detail with Wendy and Leslie in um, the webinar they did, but one hoof. So at this level, practitioners have demonstrated the techniques and skills to safely offer Surefoot to an individual horse. Um, the emphasis is on safety and role modeling good habits to, to owners. So um, I just, <laughs> I saw a case study the other day, um, just of someone, you know, they had an owner holding the rope of the horse. And when they went to swap sides, they stepped over the rope. So just little horsemanship things like that, that aren't ideal. Um, um, yeah, so we just want to always be like Wendy says, creating good habits in ourselves, so we can show others how to safely be around horses. Um, so one hoof two is about um, being able to facilitate to the owner exactly what you're doing and why, and and what the horse is perhaps experiencing. And it is about your observation. It's not about making up stories. Um, so then two hoof practitioners at this level have demonstrated the skills to work with. Um, so two to four horses um, and their owners in a group setting. So they have a solid understanding of the short foot pads and program and the concept of choice over training and know the, in, uh, the contraindications of, of short foot. So when, you know, when you start working with multiple horses, you really have to have much more of an awareness of, of, of what's happening in that moment with one particular horse when you're also perhaps dealing with another horse or owner. So three horse practitioners at this level deliver the Shawfoot um, Equine Stability Program to larger audiences and teach full day clinics. So we, the expectation there is that you already have strong public speaking skills, stamina, because <laughs> you've got to go all day, um, and be able to focus for long periods of time. They can entertain an audience. So when things go wrong, um, and I think Wendy has some good stories that she's told on YouTube about um, <laughs> some microphone issues. Um, so you need to really be able to think outside the square and um, recover quite quickly to keep moving forward when chaos is occurring. Um, and that you have the ability to, to maintain, maintain control of that environment and keep everybody, including yourself, safe at all times. So that's really important. Um, and then we go to our four hoof. Um, so at this level, the practitioner has the necessary skills and understanding to train the short program. Um, they objectively constructively guide um, the, the students attending to improve their technique, their observational skills, and um, and the application of the short foot. And, and they maintain a, um, a positive learning environment at all times. Hey, Joe, um, I've got to stop you for one second and change networks because this laptop grabbed the wrong network and it's not as strong as what I need. Okay. So I'll yep. disappear and come right back. And I'm back. Are you back? Let me just stop share and see if she's there. Uh oh. Joe. Yeah, you're back. Oh yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, I, I forget to check that. And then it's like, oh, your internet's <laughs> unstable. And I'm like, oh, yeah, OK. So I'll go back to screen share. Do, do, do. OK, play from current slide. There we go. OK, we're back. OK, so um, and in all levels, the, it is the um, key that the practitioner has the ability to sense changes um, in, in the horse's posture, their behavior, um, movement. And, in, and what's really important is the quality of, of how they lift their foot or don't lift their foot. Um, and they must have a thorough understanding of horsemanship, the horse. Um, so, you know, some uh, anatomy um, is ideal um, and the program and pads and are able to communicate to the owner what they're doing and why. Um, so, you know, not everyone will, will move up the levels. Um, you may just decide that being a one hoof just fits in with the business that you're already running. And that's fantastic. You may decide that you want to branch out and, and do um, group sessions. Um, 
yeah, so that'll sort of be entirely up to you. So today we'll just focus on, predominantly focus on the one hoof case studies. Um, so we'll flick to the next slide. If you're unsure about how to get to this stage, um, please watch Wendy and Leslie's webinar number 260. Um, and Leslie goes through the process that we have from sort of, um, firstly, oh, I'm, I would like to do this as a practitioner and then making your way through to where we are today. Um, so she's also got a timeline um, and I've just on the next slide, I've just, just got the timeline. So Leslie go, goes through the timeline to um, step three, prepare, which is, um, and then well, 3.4 is choose your case study horses. That's where we're going to start today. Choose your case study horses. So if you want to have a look at this more in detail, get a better understanding of how to get to this stage, please watch that webinar because it's a really good one. And we will have this as a document. Um, we're just fine tuning it right now, cleaning up uh, a couple of steps. And ultimately, it will. we will have a um, trail, a trail map <laughs> yeah. to be a coming yeah. short practitioner. There's lots happening, lots happening. All right, so we'll flick to the next slide. So um, how do I choose my case study horse? Well, um, please don't go out and find a wild Mustang. Um, that's never seen a human or a short foot pad and think that that's going to work out well for you because it's not. Um, one that perhaps has some behavioural issues, issues. Now we know that short foot's going to help. This is a case study. So you want it to be, oh, where's it gone? Sorry, sorry. I There was this little thing over there and I tried to get rid of it and I got rid of it. Okay, I'm back. I am thinking that you can share the... <laughs> You're very experienced. <laughs> um, yeah, so while we know that shortfoot um, is going to help horses that perhaps run away or do undesirable things, um, this is your case study. So, we, so we, we need you to be able to demonstrate certain things that I'll come to shortly. And so we want to pick horses that are going to be compliant and calm. So um, this horse with the tick next to it is actually my horse um, that I have, he's now I think 22 and I've had him since he was five. Um, so, you know, he still is after, I mean, he's been using Shawfoot, he's a very experienced Shawfoot user for about five years and every session is different. Even now, um, you know, no two sessions will ever be the same and, um, it's really quite interesting. So, you know, if you have your own horse, um, I would expect that he's that it, it has already been on short foot pads. Um, maybe that's how you got to where you are. Um, so use that horse. Uh, you can use donkeys, you can use mules, miniature ponies. Um, probably don't use a zebra. <laughs> yeah. Even though they're from the same family, I probably wouldn't recommend that. Um, you need six, you need to submit a minimum of six case studies. So ideally you need six horses. However, you can choose four horses and you can use two of those horses twice, if that makes sense. So let's say I chose Rex and he was my number one case study horse. Then I could do him again for the next case study if, if I wished, or perhaps I might use him for the last one or something. So that's certainly okay. So yeah. Pick, um, pick calm, compliant, easygoing horses. If they've already been on shore foot, that's fine. Um, that is not a problem. <clears throat> um, you want to set yourself up for success. The, yeah. the whole behind, you know, the thing about the case studies is not to make it so difficult that, you, you know, you can't submit a, a, a reasonable case study. So, you know, think about how can you set yourself up for success, which is exactly what we want to do with the horses, you know, safe, mm -hmm. support and success. And that's really what we're after here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so of course, choosing your case study horses at this stage, you will have, um, if you haven't already, you will have your pads. So I'll just throw in that there too, that in order to do your one hoof, you require a minimum of two uh, pairs of pads of different densities. However, I do say to people, it, just use one or two pads. We don't want to see you stacking them. The horse doesn't have to stand on all four. In fact, we don't want to see that at one hoof because one hoof really is about you and how you present the pad to the horse. So if you come out with one horse, 
one pad and yourself in a safe environment, fantastic. That That's all. We don't need to see anything else. So um, I will show you a, um, an example of a case study um, shortly, uh, get a bit of a, a feel for what that looks like. But yeah, that first case study, one pad, your, your horse that's experienced with Surefoot, that's just going to set you up for success. So, yeah. And, right. and uh, maybe you're going to talk about this, but uh, I'll go to the next slide. Okay. Um, yeah, so one, so one hoof is all about safety and safe technique and your ability to notice, notice changes um, in the horse. So observations will be recorded on an observation sheet that we supply as part of the case study packet. And it will include, um, so your observations of the changes in posture, um, movement, behavior, how the horse lifts his foot um, and how the applicant engages the handler in the process. If there is a handler, of course, um, you may be doing it on your own and that's perfectly okay. Um, I'll just touch on the time too. So after you've attended a workshop, you have six months to submit your case study. So the reason is that is just so you can remember what you learned at, at, the, um, at the workshop. And, and implement that into your case studies. You know, things happen. We could understand that um, life gets in the way. If you find that um, life has gotten in the way, please make contact like and let us know because we're human too. Things happen to us that are beyond our control and we want to support you as best we can. So, um, yeah, if something's, I don't know, if, you know, you're coming into winter at the end of your workshop in, you know, one of those places in America or Canada where it snows and it's minus a million degrees every day and you simply can't, there's nowhere for you to do that, do a case study, well, just let us know and we'll work something out. Yeah, we so, want to get people through the process. We don't, we, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, the point is that we want to make sure that you understand what you're doing, that you have good, safe practices and that you get through the process. We're not trying to uh, penalize or eliminate people. We just feel that the safety is really, really important. And that's, that's my biggest thing. Um, and so that's what we're really looking for here. Yeah. So just like on the photo on the screen, you can see I'm in a, um, a paddock, you know, quite a big area. Um, the other thing I'll just touch on, <coughs> um, you know, while ever we're around horses, we should be um, appropriately dressed. So, you know, no thongs or sand shoes, you know, boots are ideal. Um, I like long pants. Um, I just think that's, you know. I hate flies on my legs. Yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. um, yeah, so. Um, so long, yeah, pants, long pants are appropriate, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. And, and in the UK, when I was in the UK and did a demonstration there, I was required to wear a helmet on the ground. Yeah, right. Yeah. And gloves. So yes. you have to take yes. into consideration what the requirements are in the country that you live in. Um, like I said, in the UK, it was helmet and gloves and boots with long pants. Yes. I will just point out in this picture, so this horse has a rope halter on and a, um, a big buckled lead. Uh, where possible, use the flat halters that have an adjustment in them. So this was quite big on the horse's face um, and she was able to fully yawn, um, but I didn't like the clip. The clip, you know, when they swing round to stretch or, you know, it, it can hit them in the jaw and stuff. So that's just something to think about in your case studies is too when you're presenting them that, um, you know, what, what equipment am I being presented with? you know, have I, have I the tools to perhaps change that and just set the horse up for a more comfortable experience as well. Um, and the rug, of course, um, that's really important. Remove rugs, no leg bandages, um, no, no other tools like um, uh, um, beamer rugs or pads or um, photo uh, red photonic torches nothing else on the horse while you're doing your case study it's just about short work. yeah um and i will say you know if it's if it's really cold leaving the rug on the horse so that he's not standing there shivering um but there's you can't see as much 
you can't see what's happening in the chest. You can't necessarily see any muscle twitching. So, um, you know, obviously if it's really cold and you're in a barn where, you, you know, you, you don't, it's exposed to the elements and the horse is freezing, he's not going to give you a good case study. So, you know, take that into consideration, but it is better to not have blankets on the horse because you're not going to see a lot of things that are going yeah. on. Um, and of course this, this horse, the lady, the owner was, um, she didn't want, you know, she was worried the horse would get cold on this particular day and, you know, to have, you know, I just left it at that, but that's the owner felt more comfortable. Um, I want the owner to be happy as well. Um, so we just, I just left it at, at that. Yeah. And it wasn't a case study. It was a session. So, it, you know, and just notice that the, that the excess lead is, is um, ribboned in her hand, not wrapped around her. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good, good point. <laughs> All right, let's look at um, step 4.1, what, what, what we are looking for in our, in our case study. So the one hoof applicant must demonstrate a safe environment. So that's where you are. So ideally you don't wanna be in a stable, um, all enclosed, or, you know, too small enclosed area. There needs to be enough area for, you know, if the horse took fright or, in particular, you need to be in an area where you can walk that horse because that's part of offering Surefoot. The walk is as important or well, it's probably the most important thing, would you say, Wendy? It, it's, it's that pause between times on the pad. And if you don't have that ability to walk the horse off and, and give him a moment, sometimes, you know, you'll walk a horse off and you'll just stop and stand there. And then you'll see all this processing occur, yeah. which if you can't move him away from the pads, then, and you're in a confined space and you're trying to film, it just makes things really tight. Um, yeah. So, yeah. you know, having, especially when we're talking about the introduction of a horse to a pad, a horse, especially that's never been on one, that open environment, super important. Yes, you can use Surefoot pads in a more contained environment when the horse is custom, you know, familiar with it, comfortable with it. But in your case study, you're trying to show yourself off to the, your best advantage. So having a, a, a space, an arena or a paddock um, so that there's room and we can see that you understand the need to allow the horse to move. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And safe horsemanship practices. So we just touched on that. Um, that, that includes the attire you wear, how you hold your rope. Um, you know, again, and I've never seen it in a case study, you know, but no tying up of the horse. Um, if you're swapping sides of the horse, uh, don't step over the lead rope, you know, either go around your handler or the back of the horse. Yeah. Um, yeah so just, you know, your basic safe horsemanship practices. Um, I have, you will, we'll touch again on that. Um, so offering the pad, how you offer the pad to the horse. Um, the positioning of the pad, so how you place it on the ground. Placing the hoof on the pad, so that includes lifting of the leg um, and then placing that, that leg back down onto the pad. Allowing the horse to choose how he stands on the pad. So that might be, um, you'll often see a horse will just rest the toe on the pad. <clears throat> That's how the horse has chosen to stand step back. So I often see in the case studies, the horse has just rested the toe and then the applicant will reposition that horse to stand flat on the pad. So now there's nothing wrong with doing that. I'm sure there's a reason they've done it, but let's just let the horse choose at this stage how they want to stand on the pad and observe why they might want to stand on the pad like that. You know, there's lots of reasons. Maybe they just don't realize they can put their hoof flat or but yeah, I, th yeah, but, yeah, I mean, one horse as, as you say, there's, there's a lot of reasons I've seen some horses that just start pushing with their toe and they have to figure out how to let the back of the foot yeah. down, or they yeah. really just want to rest the toe and the whole shoulder lets down. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And it allows the horse to, and then that comes back to the choice and uh, letting the horse um, learn to discover new things and about his environment and about him. So I think that's really important. Um, how you move the horse off the pad. Um, so again, that's, I see some quite 
interesting way. Some, you know, I think the hardest thing here is, you know, some horses really get into that zone and they don't want to get off the pad. And, you know, it's like, oh my God, I'm being recorded. You need to come off because I have to show that I'm walking you off. Um, you know, so I will offer you some suggestions if that happens to, you know, different way. I mean, you could remove the pads from underneath the horse that sometimes kind of brings them back to reality a little bit. And then they're like, oh, okay, I'll go for a walk. Um, but don't force them. Um, just, yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> the, and the removing the foot, you know, if I see a horse and when he's put his weight down on that foot and, and you can see, he's not quite sure about it. I take their foot off the first time so that they don't have to sort out how to step off of it. Yeah. So that's just breaking it down a little bit more and, and being aware of the horse that you're working with and what you're observing. Um, and you know, there's no harm, no foul in removing the pad from underneath the horse's foot. I pick up the leg, I kick the pad out with my foot. So I'm not got my hand down there. There's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. In fact, in many instances, it's a good idea because some horses get, you can see they get a little frozen. They're like, oh my goodness, what is this thing? And they, and so by taking their foot off, it just helps them go, okay, this ends. Yeah. So I've, I've actually added in removing the pads. Um, if you don't kind of show it in the first couple of videos, I will, I, I'm now just asking next time, can you just show how you might remove it from underneath the horse? Because um, I think that's really important. And like uh, like Wendy said, what's really key is that some horses actually don't know how to step off. Yeah. That's it. it and I know the first couple of times I kind of worked out or, you know, realized, hey, this horse is, doesn't know what to do. Like I was mind blown. I thought, wow, that's how interesting is that? Mm. That, you know, I just thought, oh, yeah, you can walk. You know yeah. how to walk off. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then your observations made, uh, observations of the horse um, while they're on and off the pads. So you'll, you know, tick some boxes on the observation sheet. And um, so that's the other thing. I, you know, when, when you've done your case study, um, go back and review it too. Like have a look at yourself before you submit it. And, you know, if you've, or, if you filled out the observation sheet after the session, or, you know, you can do the observation sheet um, while you're reviewing yourself. Um, they're your observations too, remember? So um, I'm watching on a computer, I'm watching a video. Um, I get a pretty good feel for the session, um, but, that, but they are your observations. And so there's no right or wrong. Um, yeah, so. And there's a lot of things that, um you you might notice that we wouldn't necessarily see on a video and if you go back and watch your video and this is what having done all these webinars that i've discovered is when i go back and watch the video i see things that i would never notice yeah. in the moment because i'm either bending over or you know too close to one side and can't see what's happening on the other side of the horse so going back and watching your videos is such an amazing education that's what i found is is i'm so surprised at some of the things that i see that i didn't pick up the first time yeah sometimes. yeah um and then your self-awareness and ability to observe without judgment um so that's just how you interact with the horse, you know, where you've put, where you position yourself. Um, and of course, not making up a story. Oh, well, he's not picking his foot up because he doesn't like doing that. You know, they're just things like that. So obviously um, you can talk through your case study um, as you go along. That's, that's really good. Um, but not everyone does that and that's okay. So then whatever you've written on the observation sheet, you know, will correlate back to what I'm watching. Um, and yeah, just, I think we're so, um, we, we just want to make a story up about horses and why they don't do certain things. Um, and for me, Shawfoot's really eliminated, I guess, making an excuse for, not why the horse hasn't done it, but more how I've perhaps asked the horse to do something in particular, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think what happens is um, when we don't know why something is, we, we really, we wanna make it make sense in our world, mm -hmm. but sometimes mm -hmm. we don't have enough information 
or we become frustrated because we don't understand it. And so then we kind of make up this story to try and rationalize an experience where if we just stuck with the facts and just the, the, the straight observations without trying to make us make it make sense, a lot of times it, it'll get revealed later. Um, yeah. and, but you know, we get uncomfortable with not knowing or not, uh, you know, like being un unable to address something, you know, yeah. um, you know, like, oh, I always tell the story about the horse that everybody told me was a butthead. And I pulled him out of the stall and put his foot on a pad and in under 10 seconds, all the behavior stopped, but they didn't have a good way to address his behaviors. So they just labeled him. Yeah. And I think that that's what happens is we make up these stories when we're trying to, um, um, solve a need in ourselves for the frustration and, and insecurity and lack of understanding that we have. And so we label things to make it make a sense to us how we cope with it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the beauty of Surefoot is we don't have to make sense out of it. We no. just have to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then, yeah, just staying present, staying in the moment, um, not, you know, getting distracted by other things going on. Um, and and that, that sort of comes back to keeping you safe, the owner safe, the horse safe. Um, yeah, just being, just being self-aware. And, you know, I, I just, I just had a thought about staying present because in some places, Surefoot is so weird. You know, people see <laughs> you putting a horse on this funny piece of foam. And it's so weird that you'll have people kind of watching you and like, who's that kook over there and what are they yeah. doing? Um, and that's our own, uh, you, you know, it, we are influenced by that. And I mean, we, I went through years of it <laughs> yeah. when I first started. Um, but the ability to just e either ignore that kind of judgment that's occurring or just say, come and watch, you know? And so often what I tell people is just watch, look at the horse. Don't listen to me, just watch the horse. And so sometimes it's just better to, either kind of go where you're not going to have that observation by people that don't know what you're doing or just invite them in you know if they're watching and you're doing this and you're filming and just say well just would you like to watch um and it's and it's that kind of openness that i think is is one of the pieces about surefoot openness to the horse and what he's doing and openness to other people and what they're doing that really makes this work yeah, I've seen in some case studies, and I and I had one in particular, and I was just so impressed. Um, it was a, a one hoof case study, and I think it might have been her second. And <clears throat> the horse was standing on the pad, and the owner says, "Oh, is this where he spins around and, um, you know, like an elephant at a circus or something along those lines?" And it, and I just thought, oh, <laughs> but the applicant just kept describing what she was observing and pointing out the benefit of Shawford. And what she did was exactly that. She invited the owner in. Now, obviously, the owner was quite sceptical and she didn't let that phase her. You know, for me, I just, my, my heart sunk for her. I just thought, really? <laughs> was it necessary? You know, like, but she, you know, she just kept yeah. going. And yeah, yeah so that's and, really and important. What that shows you is the owner's feeling insecure about the whole thing. And so just getting them, if you can draw them in to look at what you're looking at and point it out, it really does change things. Yeah. Yeah. Or get them to stand on a pad. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Engage All them right. in some way. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Yep. I am having terrible slide control tonight. Wow. <laughs> I know. Well, usually the other person. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so um, six case studies are required at a minimum so I've I've only asked for an additional case uh, video case study maybe two times out of you know a hundred or something so it's quite rare and it's really just if it just you know hasn't shown anything of what we're looking for um, so it will happen occasionally and this is part of uh, choosing horses that are going to help you be successful um, so we have had people that the horse won't stand on the pad. Now, so you can still submit that as a case study um, and say you submit that and it's case study number four or five, I've, and I've seen you do all the other things in the other case studies, 
then that's okay. If it's your first case study, that's it could cause a problem because I haven't seen anything yet. So it will just depend then, I guess, on what your second one looks like. Um, so yeah, it you know, occasionally we will ask for additional ones. If you've been a uh, pre-workshop applicant and sub so therefore submitted, which we did it during the pandemic, um, case studies prior to attending a workshop, um, we say four to five before the workshop and then the additional ones afterwards. And, and that's just, we want to make sure that um, you've progressed from the workshop, um, which provides us with feedback as well. Um, yeah, so that's how we do that. So again, six different horses or four horses, two of which may be used twice. Um, submit one case study at a time. So this is quite clear in the um, case study packet. Um, you can submit your case study. I generally will take around, I might take one day or I might take seven days to um, provide you with feedback. Um, and, and that is for you to review and have a look at and go, oh, you know, I'm, I miss this, this and this. I need to make sure that that's in my next one or, oh, yeah, you know, that was perfect. That's exactly what I need to do again. So, yeah, yeah. Um, if I'm going to take longer than seven days, I will normally flick you an email and just let you know. Um, the other thing with the, submitting multiple case studies is that kind of throws me out because you're not the only one submitting case studies. So if I have someone send me four case studies one day and I have someone else send me another four the next day, it's like, oh, and I've already got applicants that are submitting case studies through, you know, on a regular basis, I can very quickly get bogged down. Um, so that kind of helps me manage my time as well if you guys are just sending them one at a time. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, feedback is there for us to review and um, ensure that we continue being successful. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, my, I'll uh, I have an example of a feedback form just to show you, um, you know, it's, I'm not going, oh, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. I will point some things out, um, you know, where you did things that I thought were really, really good. Um, or I might just say, oh, hey, you know, you bent down in, fr in front of the horse in the kick zone and move the pads with your hands. Just be aware of doing that. <clears throat> um, so observation sheet. Um, so that needs to be filled out. Um, and the video included with your case study submission. So the video must not be edited. So if you've got, um, so I guess think about a short foot session can perhaps go for 30 minutes. But within that session are lots of little short foot sessions. So um, if you've got say 20 minutes of video and you're quite able to upload that amount and there's long periods of time where the horse is just standing there, I can skip through those bits or I might see things in, I might choose to watch it in full and you know just pick up some things that perhaps you didn't. Um, if you edit it, I find people like to get a little bit um, creative with their, with um, editing their videos. And so, you know, the video will play. It hasn't showed them placing or offering the pads or placing the pads on the horse, just shows the horse swaying. And then there's some still pictures in the video and, you know, some sparkly things. And then you skip to something else. I can't get a feel of the session <laughs> when you skip back and forth. Like, so if I can watch, I can just watch it from start to finish. I can kind of, um, sometimes I feel like I'm right there standing with you watching and, you know, I can get a really good feel for what's happening and, and I feel then I can um, help you um, be more successful, successful more easily and really have an understanding of, of what was happening in that moment. So I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, just don't edit them. So uh, when you're watching one of these videos, do you want to see the entire horse in the video or? Yeah. So you should, if you're using your iPhone, turn it horizontal. Yeah. I want to see the whole. So ideally you want to have, um, it helps if you've got someone filming you. I know that that's not always possible. I actually film myself um, for writing, coaching every week and 
I'm often on my own. So um, I have a $150 Canon camera. Not sure where it is at the moment. It's just a little one and it sits on a, I have like a tripod. So I just, the camera sits on top and I take that with me and I position it somewhere where I'm going to be in full view and turn it on. You know, occasionally I might, if I'm doing in-hand stuff, I, I try and have points. I've got, say, a cone here and a, and a cone somewhere else and I try to stay in that area. If you are videoing yourself and you disappear out of frame while you walk, say, walk the horse off the pads, don't worry, I know you're going to come back. Um, you know, don't worry about that. Don't cut it out. It's, um, yeah, I know, I know. Oh, here they come. That's fine. So it is quite possible. It really is not that hard to film yourself. You know, your iPhone camera, you can lean it up against something. Yeah. Um, yeah, so or a Pivo. Oh, someone just mentioned the Pivo. Yes. Um, they're great little things. I have one of those as well. So I don't know where any of my things are, but, you know, and they'll track you. Um, but I think you have to stay within sort of a certain area. Um, and, and they will lose you sometimes. They'll wander off and see something else <laughs> and then come back. So, um, yeah, just don't edit it. Ideally, five to 15 minutes. Um, you know, if you can cover all those things, you know, um, offering the pad, positioning the pad, placing the hoof on the pad, walking the horse off, you know, that can be covered in, you know, in, in under five minutes, really. And, and then, then upload your videos to YouTube. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, um, and some people have more techie skills than others and have done things like voiceover on their video. It's not required. Yeah. It's nice, no. um, yeah. but it's not required. You don't have to like get super fancy post-production values. Um, you know, if you like to do that and you can do it well, that's fine, but it's not a requirement. Yeah. And, you know, I've had a couple where, you know, the wind that is howling and you're talking and it's hard to hear you we would be, we expect slightly better videos for two hoof and above but really again in one hoof it's okay don't worry about it you know don't go oh my god she can't hear what i'm saying the wind's howling and you know yeah, i'm gonna have to run your next case study see if you can find a quieter environment yeah. but don't yeah. don't just chuck it out because yeah you know yeah because you just become disheartened and it becomes too hard and we don't want it to be hard yeah yeah, we want it to be easy. Yeah, especially those first two. I think if you can get past the second submission, you're on a roll. You're good to go. Yeah. But it's just that first two, one or two, that people just think, oh, my God, I, you know, my hair is messy or, you know, the horse was not, you know, it's, um, I know when I used to feel, you know, take pictures and stuff, you, you know, I used to make sure the horses all brush. Now, I don't. It doesn't matter now. <laughs> you know, I don't worry so much. I still try to make my hair look a bit. But, oh, yeah, and you yeah, might want to brush right. the thick mud off the leg because you're going to be handling it. <laughs> but, you know, if it's been raining for 40 days and 40 nights and there's nowhere that's mud free, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, um, and then upload. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then upload your videos to YouTube, mark them unlisted. Um, that's so anyone you provide the link to will be able to view them. If you leave them, or when you upload to YouTube, but they automatically list them as private, that means only you can view them. Um, don't make them public because then everyone can see them, unless, of course, you want everyone to see them. Um, but oh, the, the private you. setting means that they can, not the private setting, the unlisted setting they're there. If somebody really knew where to search, they might find them, but most likely not. There's so much content on YouTube. And then yeah. you can take the link and share the link. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, so we'll flick to the next slide. And of course, you know, you just said, if you're not feeling confident, reach out to Joe. It's true. Joe's gotten really practiced at doing these case studies and and the whole, again, the whole goal is to get you through the process and just give you good feedback so that you just improve your technique. That's really, we're just trying to help. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so additional requirements. Um, so sometimes I'm, well, you can uh, supply additional um, information by way of photos, another video, if perhaps it didn't sort of show everything you wanted. Um, occasionally I will get a case study that doesn't have the observation sheet attached. 
Um, that's either because you haven't done one or they've forgotten. Um, that, that's part of it. You have to have the observation sheet. Um, yeah, or if your video is unsuitable, you know, for whatever reason, like it's dark or that, I haven't seen that. I haven't really had any, you know, sounds really been the only issue or edited videos. They're just, the edited videos are just really hard to watch. Um, so I might suggest that you ref review certain things um, to help you. So they would include um, the case study packet that we that you were provided with at the workshop, the quick study guides. There's a lot of short, um, Wendy's broken down some into just uh, about two minutes long. Uh, they're, they're great. Um, I'll often refer someone to a particular one of those. The Shorefoot workbook, so they're, that's the, I mean, well, that, no, that's the old, because you, you gave us a workbook when you came to Australia, remember? I did. We had, did. yeah, you gave us, it was like a, just wasn't, it was just pieces of paper all joined together, oh, okay. but there was information. Okay. Yeah, it was messy. And the first workbook is really all about that safety perspective. It's perfect yeah. for the yeah. one hoof applicant to work, to work through and also to work with the owners using that one hoof, uh, that first workbook so I, I it's it's coming uh i keep saying that we've been working on it for quite a while now but it's getting closer every day <laughs> yep yep um and then notes um from from your workshop that you took any notes um online learning so again we have the online learning course um you can you can retake that anytime you can go back and review that um a surefoot mentor so I guess I, I become your mentor if I'm reviewing your case studies. That's kind of a system we have that's coming. Um, but you might have had, say, a friend or a colleague that you went to the workshop with. Um, you know, if they live close by, like, get together and do your case studies and then you can help each other or, you know, touch base. Um, and then, of course, feedback from your previous case study submissions um, is good for, for review. Um, but it's a very... You know, oh, most ahead. people show everything they need to. Yep. Um, and then I've uh, I have a Patreon account now. It's under the name Murdoch Method, mm -hmm. and there are Surefoot videos there. And um, the case studies that I did up in Canada back in whatever year that was now, 2019, um, of Bob and Shiner. Those those are all up there, mm -hmm. and so they're uh, un they're broken into segments, but they're basically unedited where you can just see how I went through working with a skeptical horse that was um, sort of uh, withdrawn and uncertain. And then a thoroughbred who was incredibly distracted and he was under saddle. Um, so, but they, they're great because we filmed the whole thing. And so it's broken into like 10, roughly 10 minute segments. So if you really wanna kind of see what that would be like working with a horse over multiple days that that content is available and we will be putting up more content on the patreon site so it's just another resource for you yeah yeah um but yeah i can't overemphasize. you know before you begin after your workshop um before you begin your first case study just even watch the 20 minute quick start guide just as a little refresher like i still watch it now like you know, I, and I still pick things up and yeah, it's, they're un, unbelievably helpful. So, all right, <clears throat> let's move along. Then, so feedback. So it's to assist you in progressing your skills in safety, observation, horsemanship and application. So this is just a little example of the one horse feedback form. Um, so I'm gonna put the feedback date your name, your case study level um, and number. So one hoof case study number three, um, horse information. That's what you filled out on the observation sheet. So um, pretty much I just, I just will write, you know, detailed or um, incomplete. You know, if you haven't put what, you know, the um, age of the horse or what it's used for or anything like that. I've never had that. I, that's really just a single word. Um, YouTube photos, I'll actually put the link to your YouTube video in here. And then, um, you know, I might put something like clear and good length or um, um, edited video um, request to resubmit. 
um, un, unedited video. So I have had someone that <clears throat> did a really great job of making a fantastic um, video to watch, but I, I, I couldn't, I, it was really difficult to watch. And so I just said, can you just submit to me your original video? And that's, so that's what she did. And that was, that was fine. There was no problem there. Um, and then I've just got what we, what we're looking to see. So the applicant demonst demonstrated, did you demonstrate um, doing the case study in a safe environment? So I'll just give you a tick if that's, if you're in a stable, I might just say, you know, something like, um, you know, not, not, not a suitable area to, to conduct a, short foot session, you know, try to find somewhere else. Um, safe horsemanship practices. Um, again, that's sort of if you've, you know, got your lead rope on the ground and you're walking over the, you know, stepping on the lead rope or stepping over it or continually bending down in the kick zone, using your hands to place the pad. Um, so, yeah, I'll just go through those things and I just... Pretty much you're always going to see a tick. Um, and then, <coughs> excuse me, at the bottom of it, I've always just have just a clarification of pad density and colours in order of stability. Um, that's just because some people, um, you know, and it could be just because you're nervous about the case study, but I have someone offering a hard orange pad and say, you know, and I offer the horse the medium pad, <laughs> you know, so it's just a, like I, you know, you get muddled up in the beginning. So that's just to help you guys. And then just a reminder of horizontally positioning of the iPhone or the phone if you're using a phone. So that's, um, and then I will, I have, I didn't include it on here. Wendy's got just an example of, of a sheet that I completed for someone. So we'll have a look at that in a sec. Um, so we'll just skip through. We might watch a quick video of um, a one hoof case study. So, um, Actually, I might, I maybe I might bring it up. Okay, I'll stop my share. Oh, hang. No, okay. Oh, yeah. Then I can. Okay, hang on two secs while I bring it up. Oh, yeah. We're just going to go to that. Okay. Um, all right. Let me just close these. Okay, so um, make sure I made you co-host. Hang on. Yeah, your co-host. Um, wait a sec. So where do I go to share my screen? Bottom button where in the center says share screen is the green button. Oh, yep, right green button. Um, share screen. And you just have to figure out which window you're going to share. Oh, yeah. Why are there so many windows? Because oh, you obviously have windows open. Oh, I see. Okay, hang on. <laughs> mm, okay, I should, that's, oh, see, I'm learning something. Yay! Okay, hang on. Why is she not showing up? <laughs> Oops. We'll close that one. All right, let's see now if this works. Oh, yep. Yeah, yeah, look at that. Share. Okay. Uh, All right. So, okay. Can we see that? Yep. All right. So, I'll just start playing it. So, this um, is an applicant one hoof second case study. Um, so, she's just. Um, she was just telling me, I'll just stop it there for a minute. She was just introducing the horse and herself, um, telling me how old he was, what he was used for, um, his breed, um, just a basic introduction, which was really good. Um, and now she's just showing um, him the pad and... He's so what? cute. He yeah, has to check cute. it out with each nostril. Yep. And so now she's popped the pad on the ground. She's kicking it around a little bit to make sure he's okay. And she's got a lead rope nicely laid in her hand. 
And then we saw her put her hand down on the pad to move it. Yeah. Yeah. So what was really interesting here is that, um, so she said he sometimes has some trouble lifting his, his feet up mm -hmm. and I could hear. <laughs> so in the feedback form, so every time she went to lift his legs up, I could hear this kissing. And um, when, <laughs> when I did the feedback, I just said, oh, you know, um, we, can, we can have a look at that. But um, anyway, she said to me later, it was the owner that was kissing. And I'm oh. Like, oh. <laughs> so that happens. And a lot. Um, yeah, as you become more confident, um, you know, you find ways to just suggest to the owner that it's okay. This is part of the process. I'm just getting a feel for how the horse wants to pick up his feet. Um, you know, blah, blah, blah. We'll, you know, yeah. So, yeah, it was, um, but I'm glad she replied because it wasn't her. It was, um, yeah, it was a horse. Um, so yeah, so she's just going to show. Um, now it would be nice if she kept her hand behind her back with the rope, but that's okay. And then she's placed his foot down. So we won't watch it all, but there's just, um, so she's in a really good environment. She's in a round yard. Um, there's quite a bit of space, but you notice when she does walk him off that she doesn't go very far. So now she's just observing, um, or just um, speaking out loud what she's observing. And you'll notice she has one pad. She's just got the half physio pad. That's fantastic. It was really nice as he dropped his neck there and then he saw something. Mm. So he came yeah. up with it. Yeah. So I'll just flick through. Oh, okay. So yeah, so he does. So he checks in with her, which was really cute. Comes around. Lots of blowing out. Lowers his neck there a bit more. Yeah, looking and yeah, there's his blowing yeah. out and looking and chewing. Yeah. 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 So that was um was really cool. <clears throat> so he's on there for, you know, we're at three minutes, 3.3 .3 minutes. So, you know, he's been on there for a considerable amount of time. I can't quite remember. I think she said he had been on pads before. Can't quite remember. Um, but it's only one pad. It's only the physio pad. He's a really big horse. Um, she didn't, I don't recall her saying that there was um, much swaying. So we'll just watch her walk him off. So, oh, oh sorry, that was me. So, okay. So she kind of pulls him off to the left. Um, so I see this quite a bit. Um, Ideally, we really want them to come off straight, forward and straight. Um, um, when you kind of pull them off to the side a bit, my thought is you, you pull them off balance. Yeah, if you take them and off. if they're already off balance, it's, you know, I to me, walking forward and straight, they don't have to nav navigate a turn while stepping off something that's um, already unstable. Um, but just to note in that, so I actually took a photo of a screenshot of this and I just drew an arrow straight ahead with just one sort of coming off and just said, you know, be aware, try and walk straight. But while she's in a really good, safe environment where she set herself up in the round yard isn't ideal for lots of walking or, you know, like, a, a you know, she's near the, the, um, the, the fencing, so she doesn't have a lot of space to walk forward straight and forward for very long before she is going to have to turn him anyway. So we'll just watch. And some horses don't walk off a pad straight, but that's their choice as opposed yes. to taking them yep. off on an angle. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a really sharp, you know, I mean, this circle is five meters and then she's come back. Bent. Okay. That bent down in front, picked up. We won't sort of go there. So she's now she's going to try some other things. So I'll just stop it there. So, um, you know, it was a really good introduction, great area. You know, she let, she offered the pad. So she, you know, went down the things. Um, what I, so I ticked everything, but then I just, with the 
uh, walking the horse off because that was the only time this horse walked off or around in the 13 minutes. Oh, wow. One walk off the pads. So um, now she went to and she offered the two hards, um, no walk in, bet you know, in between at the different density of pad. And then she offered in a, a slant behind while he's already standing on the two hards. So, <clears throat> yeah, there wasn't sort of enough breakdown. And that's when I mean, you know, in a, in a, even a 10 minute video, there's multiple sessions of Surefoot. There's multiple offerings. There's multiple placements, multiple opportunities for you to show what you need to show. Um, but it was a really good case study. Like she just did awesome. Um, and I, I was really pleased I had this to, um, cause I had a different one to show, but I, I just, I really liked this um, you know, she she was there in the moment. She was explaining it as the video was rolling it and the owner was there. So, you know, I knew she was then um, letting the owner know why she was doing it and what she was observing. And, um, yeah, it was, it was really, really. Um, so, so someone's asking if you prefer side view to front view. Uh, not necessarily, no. You know, if you if you're filming if someone's filming you they'll tend to move around a little bit okay so stop there because yeah <laughs> the rope handling right there we just want to yes. talk about that for a second yeah she wound up getting a bit over the rope and if he had no, pulled just... his head up at that point it would have uh um really been painful <laughs> So it's after she picks up the two pads. And these are the kinds of things that in terms of the safety that we're looking for, it's, you know, here's, watch the ropes on the ground. She offers the pad that's great, right? And then, and then she yeah, gets steps over, steps the rope. over the rope right there and she catches it, right? Um, but, but what that tells me is that she didn't have control of her rope prior to. Um, yeah. And so those are just the subtle little things. And the reason that we're, uh, um, I'm pointing that out is, it, it it goes back to safety and the, everything worked out just fine. We're really glad. However, that was a potentially dangerous moment. Um, now I picked up on that, but I didn't put it in the feedback. And that was because I had a quick look at her case study from previously. And I didn't notice any concerns with the rope handling. So I didn't mention it. How did if that was to occur in the in the next one, so I, you know, um, we were we were talking about this today, actually, weren't we? Like about trainers reviewing their work, um, and so, you know, for me, the next one, like I'll make a note. The next one, I'll just, you know, just review uh, rope handling skills. Yeah. So you know, was it a one off because she was, if she was in a hurry, then she's not in the moment. But I think it was, you know. I right. wasn't she, she quickly corrected don't get me wrong but yes it, but those yes. are the types of things when we're talking about a one hoof the safety is really the key and yeah. so you know it's not just about surefoot it's about being around horses in general and we all know that something can happen in the blink of an eye um yeah. you know like i've seen people put lead shanks over their shoulder and it makes me crazy and then when there was you know somebody got killed because they had a lead shank over their shoulder so Having been, and, and it's my my thing, having been as badly injured as I have with horses and having had to recover from those really mm -hmm. serious injuries, which still I live with, um, I'm, you know, the safety is the, is what concerns me. And so um, just, I just wanted to point that out. Um, but and I that think leads, too, we don't want to get, you know, when that, when you do have such a compliant and calm horse, um, although, you know, you look at his eye here and he's not, he's not 100 percent confident mm -hmm. about the whole thing um you know when we know that this breed really is a relatively low flight horse um but at the end of the day he's still a horse and anything can happen and they tend so, to internalize some of your drafty type horses yeah, um, yeah. and you can and see so that we, a bit yeah so we should probably move along but anyway that's sort of you know this was if you want to view if you want to record from the front because you're recording yourself and that's just where you are that's fine Yep. That's, so there's that's, another question here. Why keep the rope, uh, the keep hand with rope behind the back? Um, is it putting her in an asymmetrical position? The whole purpose of that, and it was the only way I could um, consistently 
prevent a hand from being near a hoof was to put that hand somewhere else. So in other words, no matter how often I told people to not put their hand down by the foot to put the pad underneath the foot, it happened with top professionals. And so by placing your hand on your back, either holding another pad or holding the lead shank or just the hand on your back in general, it completely eliminates the ability to put your hand down by the foot because you only have one hand to pick up the leg and no other hand available. And so it, 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 it solved a problem that was consistent and it is foolproof if you get in the habit of doing it. You will not put your hand down by the foot. And the thing is when you're that low, if you are using your hand to position the pad, you have bent over a huge amount and you're not where you can quickly move away. If something startles that horse and he starts to come over you, you can't get away. But if you have one hand on your back and you're more upright and you use your foot to kick the pad underneath the foot, um, you, you can quickly move out of the way. So it, yeah, it was the only way I could stop people from putting their hand down there. Believe I think the me. other thing too, is I see a lot when people are, um, and I hate the word throwing, but uh, so throwing the pad to position it near the hoof um, is that they'll bend down to do it and lower themselves as much to the, to the ground as possible to make the throw less distance. Um, so that again puts you in a vulnerable position. But the other thing I want to say is um, I, the more you go along, you get um, a real feel for the different density of pads and surfaces and how much effort is required to place that pad where you want to put it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think it was like if anyone's ever done any Pirelli stuff and the first time, you know, you get your carrot stick and the string and it, you know, you hit yourself in the eye and your horse in the head and it's just, it's really looks awful. <laughs> and um, this, this process in the beginning kind of remind me of a bit of that as well. So, but you're Learn, just learning anything new in the beginning. Yeah. It's awkward and messy. And the, but the more you practice for good technique, the easier it gets. And, and that good technique, the, the technique that we use is because it's effective and simple. Um, yeah. And so, and, and like I said, foolproof, um, it's, it really, um, we don't want that hand down by the foot because quite frankly, there's a lot of horses when the first time they stand on a sure foot pad, they lose their balance a little and they step and you don't want your feet or your hands or your head down in a vulnerable area um and this and horse is yeah. a great example of of that right i know this case study this is awesome yeah. and the other thing too is like i found if you uh, uh place the pad to the side of the hoof and push it underneath as opposed to placing the pad in front of the foot um i do have an example of it I'm, i didn't I haven't i'm not quite sure where it is though but you okay, know, sometimes we can always I'll, publish it later. Yeah, sometimes I, yeah, I will. I'll put it in the comments. Sometimes I see um, they've picked the foot up, put their leg in front of the pad, which is in front of the horse, pushed it back, placed the hoof, but then the hoof slipped off the pad. And, you know, so many times I think, oh my God, your toes, you know, and at the last minute they've moved their foot. But, um, you know, I wonder how many times people have actually... Yeah. And I, I think people don't, uh, um, in general, we tend to underestimate the horse's loss of balance when he's yeah. first experiencing surefoot. In fact, you know, like it, if a pad's gonna get damaged, it's almost always in the first couple instances because the horse loses his balance a little and then steps over onto the edge and the edges can't handle the difference between the weight on the pad and the weight on the ground. So you'll get some damage on the edges, but it's because the horse lost balance and had to reposition or move that foot. And so that's what we're hoping to avoid is that any body part of yours is where that foot might wind up because the horse loses his balance. Yeah, yeah. Now, can you see the new screen? I've got, that's Sue? Sue, I see Sue. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So let's, um, if I play the sound, we'll let, let's just see. Uh, BB is currently unemployed. She is an off-track thoroughbred, but she hasn't yet been restarted for a second career. 
Uh, what we've been experiencing with BB is that she has separation anxiety with her pasture mates. And so uh, walking her to and from the field has been a bit acrobatic as of late. Um, and when she and says acrobatic, that's what she means. Cause I've seen yeah. her first. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, we don't really want to encourage the vertical rearing that, <laughs> that she is known for. Um, so she's already quite settled. We were right beside the barn. She's already made it in, but you get a little flair for how she's feeling. Um, and that she does like to be, uh, she's got a little zip in her, in her doodah. So we decided to try the surefoot pads. This is her first time experiencing them. We began with the, the physio pad and we're going to use the hard to start just under her left front. And you'll see that um, she is only standing on the pad for maybe two, three seconds, and she's already walking off. Um, the thing that you'll notice about Surefoot is that it really isn't the amount of time that they're on the pad. There still can be some really incredible results with something so, so seemingly um, simple. So this is an, oh, I love Sue. Um, <clears throat> So she's done a voiceover. Um, this was actually her first uh, two hoof case study, I think. Um, so she's used a horse that, although um, Sue ha does the rehoming of thoroughbreds, so they're all have a, what did she say? Doodah and zippity doodah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, uh, but, you know, it's snowing. Um, or it has been, you know, it's slippery. Um, she's got a nice, safe environment. She's walked the horse past us while she's introduced us. She's, you know, come back. She's just got one pad. This is a six minute video. And it, um, you know, the horse has touched the pad with its foot, stepped off, and Sue's gone for a nice straight walk, brought her back around, and now she's going to continue on with the process. So this wasn't. In the walk there. Let... She's already slowing down. Her head's lowering. Uh, okay. She. And you also notice when she is in that anxious or tense mode, like most horses. Okay, so she bends. This is not ideal, um, but, you know, she probably should have kicked it away a little bit more. Um, I would have liked to have seen that. But, again, this is not a one hoof. It's a two hoof. Um, and this horse was quite agitated. Um, so, and the other thing with how Sue approached this is she actually went through the, the she got down to business, really. Um, she didn't kind of fluff around too much. She did offer it to the horse, like the horse is like, yeah, oh yeah, that's interesting. And then she got, she kind of got to it. Um, that what we saw, yeah, she's not really I'll just turn the sound this. off. Yeah, so she's not really focused on what's going on. Um, but what we see as it goes as Sue goes along in this really short period of time is how this horse now stands still. Yeah, I and mean, that, that horse was maybe on the pad for a couple of seconds. And when she came back yep. around, that horse put her nose on that pad. Yeah. So now, you know, she waited, she's had a sniff. Describing what she's seeing. And because the horse, so had Sue, right, so had Sue gone, right, well, now we're going for a walk, that horse was already walking. So what I really liked in this was the horse went, oh, I can just, I actually don't have to move my feet. I am safe here with you um, and I'm just going to stand here. And so I, I just, you know, Sue read the situation Yes. And, and she's a very experienced horsewoman that handles a lot of thoroughbreds, both that are racing and off the track. Yeah. So, you know, um, and I love this video because it shows the power of Surefoot in like two seconds. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, you know, she's now just the horse is standing still. And so Sue's and, just hanging out. She hasn't offered the pad again. And here we go, ready to walk. And there, there is the value of the pause of, um, mm -hmm. of waiting for a moment. And this is where the practice and experience comes in is, yeah. you know, in this case, letting the horse stand for a moment was the absolutely right thing to do. And you saw yeah. she took a moment and then she touched the pad. So she wasn't ignoring it. It just took her a moment to kind of process it through. And here she's already in 
you know, moments, um, checking in with that pad, checking in with Sue, you know, total change in, in attitude. Yep. Yeah. And here, you know, again, when we break down one session into multiple, this is the third time that Sue's now gone through the process. So, um, yeah, in a six minute video. Yeah, and we're only three minutes in. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's a great example <laughs> of, um, of a case study. Right. Yeah. So um, I just, we're running out of time probably. So I just wanted to show you one more. Um, let me just bring that up. Um, this all, this really only goes for a very short period of time. I like a minute. Um, okay. Um, okay. Uh, just have to find where. Now this is, we're gonna look at this one. Um, so I'm gonna wait till, so I haven't got her in it. This is about what can go wrong if we're not being aware. So I just have to share my screen again. Okay, so we'll just watch. No blinking. Or very, very little. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, right before he did that, the owner says or handler said, oh, do you want me to move a bit closer? And I'm like, no, <laughs> don't move closer. And then off it went. But um, do, yeah, and just so take that back to just just before, because this is where observation is. Mm -hmm. You know, you're yeah. yeah, you're looking at the horse and he's he's rather the ears are super focused forward and he's um there are a couple of eye blinks but there so there's now there are no more right there's no eye, there's a little eye blink but he's watching something at that moment he he's not necessarily aware of where he is he's watching something else you can see by the intention in his ears and his eyes right and there's an ear flick right and that's the that's the thing is that he suddenly, can you just back that up and freeze that where he looks down? And, you know, this is where he's on two pads. So he, he not, doesn't have a lot of choice at this moment about what, whoa, right there, freeze it there, right? And so you can see how when he went to look and he's trying to line his eyes up to look how much out of balance he is. And that pad that he's standing on is gonna give the one on the, under the left front foot and so he can't feel solid ground under his feet. Now, what we don't know in this particular video is, was there any indication of this when she presented a pad? We don't know because we don't have that in this clip. Yeah. Right? But I, I'm hard pressed to think that we didn't see any of this in a presentation. It was coming before. I saw it coming before, like, right. Um, and this is no reflection on the, the um, person doing the case study. Right. She actually had, she's a very experienced um, body worker and um, she was in a barn with perhaps owners that were unsure about what she was wanting to do to their horses. Right. Um, so, you know, they were quite skeptical. Um, and... Uh, she had not been to a workshop. So this was one of the pre-workshop uh, case studies. From, yeah, pandemic pre-case yeah. pre study. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, but, um, yeah. And this is where there's, on the, on the Patreon film that I put up, Shiner, 
gives me a little bit of an indication. I had a rider on, gave me a little bit of this indication. I immediately took the rider off, but this is the kind of thing that I, I, I would, oh yeah, there is some earlier. Um, yeah. But just, again, the environment, you know, where is this horse going to go in this environment? He doesn't have a lot of choice, right? He's looks down and he's got to go sideways, but we know there's a wall there. And so this yeah. is why, you know, in that beginning, the more space you have, the safer you are, the better off you are. Cause he's, uh -huh. he's got not a lot of choices here. Mm. Yeah. So, um, and she's great. There's no pressure on the lead, but you can see it's like, where do I go? And he does not know how to go forward off that pad. That's for sure. Yeah. So, Nearly runs down the videographer. Yeah. I'm glad she didn't move any closer. Yeah. So, you know, that's just, um, I guess the, um, I just... the, the times when something untoward happens are they're rare I, I you know i i mean the whole reason that surefoot is what it is right now is because the most the majority of horses stand on a pad and totally let down and everything's awesome however the whole purpose of all the training and everything is not for the guy in the middle of the road it's for the outliers it's for horses like this it's the one that i had bronc off pads it's the one that i had faint and fall down you know <laughs> um it's those outliers and so it's our, our ability to always plan for the outlier, you know, hoping that everything's going to go great and there's not going to be any problem, but plan for the outlier because when you find one, it happens so fast that there's not a lot of, you don't have time. You don't have yeah. time. You have to set it up so that if it happens, you have set it up to the best of your ability to be safe for everybody involved. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't show that to frighten anybody or, mm. um, you know, just that this it is, can happen. Yeah, it can happen. And um, it's a really good example. I showed it to um, when we had a, the workshop here in Australia with Robin and um, I just showed it on the Sunday afternoon and, you know, everyone was like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. Because but, for the most part, it goes really well. I mean, that's yeah. um, and and. Um, Joe had had the ability to see that we did a great workshop in Australia back in in October in 2019 and then we went to work with a horse and um, Gracie was going to do our case study and we had a similar yeah. kind of uh, experience with a horse that is handled blanketed ridden shown you know and yet there was in my opinion a uh, proprioceptive lack in yeah. one leg um, jumping a meter 50 and he yeah. Yeah, and you know when Gracie I think had started hadn't she and um you know we were really thankful Wendy was there because we were kind of like mm, yeah yeah um, um and it's you can't really set those horses up in a workshop you don't you know you you never know when you're going to run into them but that that horse is exactly why we emphasize safety so much because there these outliers exist um, yeah. And, and yeah, that yeah. particular horse, I remember Gracie couldn't pick up his left front. And when she went to the right, that's when he like was, oh my God. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, it's just, we're not trying to scare anybody, but we want people to be well aware of the potential. Um, and yeah. the more you set yourself up for success, practice good safety with every horse you handle, then you reduce the risks to everybody involved. And hence yeah. the reason for the case studies. Which, yeah, and so and so just we on the case study like Sue's that we watched. If the horse touches the pad, steps off, and away it goes, that counts. That count. You, you I, I've seen you offer place, pick up the foot. That counts. And what counts even more is the fact that you let allowed to walk off. Yeah. So, um, but I think I think that's that's it. Um, just the last slide. I've just got a picture of me on my reps <laughs> and, um, and my email address. So, you know, you can email me anytime, um, any so, questions. What's your email? I'll put it in the chat here. Uh, Joe Watman, J-O-W-H-A-T-M-A-N at yahoo.com.au. There you go. Awesome. But, you know, it's, I love watching the case studies. I love you guys making horses happy. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's really cool. So um, hey, don't anybody be got any questions before we wrap this up? If you do, just pop it in the chat. Um, 
you know, you can always reach out to us. You can always reach out at info at surefootycoin.com or reach out to Joe and we can always forward emails to Joe if, yeah. if you've forgotten our email address. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're really working hard to, to be putting workshops together, certainly here in the United States. Um, um, Alex is working on scheduling. I'm hoping to be able to do one a month in different parts of the country. Um, you know, obviously subject to change. And um, we're really hoping to be able to do something over in the UK. And um, so stay tuned, keep an eye on the uh, calendar on the Surefoot Equine YouTube uh, website. And um, thanks everybody for joining. And thanks, yeah, Joe. Yeah. that was a great presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.